Hello and welcome back to another episode. In this video I'm gonna review Wings of Fury for the Commodore Amiga. And we're also going to take a look at the Nintendo Game Boy Color version, plus the PC DOS version and the Commodore 64 version as well. And let's go! Wings of Fury is a side-scrolling shooter which was created by Steve Waldo in the year 1987. It was first released for the Apple II computers in the same year and it was published first by the company Brotherband Software. In 1989 the game was also released for the NEC PC98 computer and the Sharp X68000 computer. And in 1990 the game was also released for the Amstrad CPC, then the PC-DOS, Commodore 64 and the Commodore Amiga. This is the version that I'm also going to show and review in this video. And in the same year, in 1990, there should have been also an Atari ST version, but for unknown reasons this version was never released. And in 1999, Wings of Fury was also released for the Nintendo Game Boy Color. And even though Steve Waldo created Wings of Fury and made the Apple II version, all the other conversions were made by different companies. In the case of the Commodore Amiga version, it was done by a company called Unlimited Software, which was a division of the company Distinctive Software. And they already made a couple of other conversions for the Commodore Amiga, for instance, Test Drive and Test Drive 2 The Duel. In Wings of Fury you take control of a fighter pilot during World War II. The year is 1944, the place the Pacific and you are stationed on board the aircraft carrier USS Wasp. Your task in every mission is to eliminate all Japanese forces in each level with your trusty Grumman F6F Hellcat fighter aircraft. To accomplish that you have four different kinds of weapons available. The Hellcats board machine guns, bombs, rockets and torpedoes. Beside the machine guns, which you have available at any time and unlimited ammunition as well, you have to choose which other type of weapon you want to equip your Hellcat with before every launch. For each weapon you get a different amount of ammunition, either 30 bombs, 15 rockets or 1 torpedo. But not every weapon is effective on every target. With bombs you can destroy barracks, soldiers and sandbag bunkers. 
With rockets you can destroy concrete bunkers, ships anti-aircraft guns and also the same stuff like with bombs. With torpedoes you can destroy again the same stuff like with bombs if you want to, but it is the only weapon that can destroy enemy ships. Depending on the ship type you're gonna need between 1 and 3 torpedoes in order to sink it. And finally with the machine guns you can destroy enemy planes, soldiers and enemy torpedoes if they have been already deployed into the water. Sandbag bunkers are the only targets which can't be destroyed completely and they are also the only targets which enemy troops can rebuild and enter. An intact sandbag bunker houses a working anti-aircraft gun which is constantly shooting at the player. Destroying it with bombs, rockets or a torpedo will force the soldiers inside to leave the bunker and to find another sandbag bunker for shelter. If a soldier goes into a previously destroyed sandbag bunker, he will activate the anti-aircraft gun and start shooting again. The barracks can only house soldiers. If they get destroyed, they collapse. And the soldiers inside will run to the next sandbag bunker. Soldiers can't enter barracks and they also can't enter any concrete bunkers. And if those get destroyed, no soldier will leave those bunkers. Only if you have eliminated all the soldiers of an island, it counts as cleared. A little flagpole in the middle of the island helps you as an indicator. If there is a flag still waving, then there is at least one enemy soldier left on the island. No flag means no enemies left and you also get a message on the bottom of the screen telling you that you have cleared the island and how much extra points you have earned for that. You also get a message when you sink an enemy ship and the game also tells you when you have cleared the level from all the enemies. Then you have to fly back, land and continue with the next level. The screen is divided into three sections. The game screen, then below the status bar and on the bottom the message bar. On the game screen happens all the action and as you have already noticed it changes its view depending on the altitude of your plane. If your aircraft is closer to the ground you have a close up view and if you fly higher up into the sky it changes to a far distance view. By the way to avoid fire from the anti-aircraft guns you have to fly somewhere between the middle and the maximum altitude of the level. In the status bar from the left to the right you see what type of ammunition you have and the amount you have left of it plus your life counter. Then there is the oil gauge, which is basically your life bar. Every time your plane gets hit, you lose a little bit of oil pressure. Plus, you slowly but constantly lose oil pressure the further your plane gets damaged. A red blinking light in the middle of the oil gauge indicates that your plane is in pretty bad shape and that you need to land as soon as possible on your aircraft carrier for some repairs. If the oil pressure reaches zero, your plane will crash. Your plane will also crash every time you touch or hit any object in a level and there is also no chance of an emergency landing on water or on land. As soon as you have reached the ground you lose a life. Crashing a plane on an island or a ship has the same destructive force like a rocket. So if you crash into a bunker, barrack, soldier, anti-aircraft gun on a ship or a concrete bunker it gets destroyed. Right next to the oil gauge there is a little window with a first person view. If you are on a low altitude and the game screen is in close up mode, a crosshair will appear and it can help you to shoot down enemy planes. The crosshair is not really helpful for destroying ground targets with rockets, since it is not very accurate. This window can also be helpful for judging distances, since islands, ships, planes and ground targets will be displayed if you fly on a low altitude. And the last thing that this little window can tell you or show you is that a red arrow will appear either on the left or right side of the screen, telling you that an enemy plane armed with a torpedo is on its way to destroy your carrier. Next to the first person view window there is a fuel gauge telling you how much fuel you have left. It also has a blinking red light 
which starts to blink if you're running low on fuel. And if you run out of fuel, your plane will also crash. And next to the fuel gauge you have a point counter and below you have two counters for all the enemy planes that you have already shot down. One is a number counter and the other one is displaying this number with plane symbols. The enemy planes in the game are Mitsubishi A6M-0 fighter aircrafts. Enemy planes can only be attacked and destroyed if they are in the air. Planes on ships or islands are invincible. Plus, on the islands they are also protected by a net. Now normally those nets were used to camouflage the planes so that they couldn't be spotted from the sky. But in this game the net swallows rockets and bounces off bombs or torpedoes. There are two different kinds of enemy planes. Fighter planes and torpedo planes. The normal fighter planes, which are either stationed on an island or a ship, will take off as soon as they see your plane and they try to shoot you down. Normally only one plane from one location will take off and chase after you, but if you come across another plane from a different location it will take off as well. Two enemy planes at once is the maximum that you will encounter at the same time. After you were able to shoot down an enemy plane, the next one will take off if you fly over its location. Except you have already sunk the ship or cleared an island of all enemy forces where the plane was stationed on. Then this won't happen. The torpedo planes are not stationed on a ship or an island. They basically come out of nowhere and they will also appear even if you have already destroyed all fighter planes in a level or when there actually are no fighter planes in a level. Like the name already suggests, those planes are armed with a torpedo and they are only interested in destroying your carrier. They fly always on a low altitude and they are not going to attack you. Even when you attack them, they are going to try to outmaneuver you, but they will not fire at you. If they get close enough to your carrier, they drop the torpedo and then fly away. And by the way, your carrier will sink after 5 torpedo hits, and then it is an instant game over. Doesn't matter how many lives you have left, since all your lives slash planes were on board the destroyed carrier. Now there's no way of telling when a torpedo plane is going to appear, but it happens more often if you are far away from your carrier and there are more torpedo planes attacks, the longer you need to finish a level. The game has 7 ranks slash difficulty levels, which you can choose freely at the beginning of the game. Each rank has up to 3 missions. If you finish the last mission of a rank, your carrier will welcome and celebrate you with balloons. Then you get promoted to the next rank and you start with the first mission of that rank, plus you get an extra life. And this is the only way to get an extra life in this game, so it doesn't have anything to do with the score. Most of the missions take place during the day, but there are also a few night missions. Now while I was recording footage for this review I wasn't able to find a night mission, but I'm gonna show you two pictures later on of a night mission in this review and except for the fact that the background is black instead of light blue, plus the status bar has some slightly dark colors, there is actually no difference between a day and a night mission. Now to be completely honest, I've never played and beaten all the missions in Wings of Fury, so I can't really tell you how many missions the game actually has. According to my research, the game has 21 missions and there is no ending. If you are able to finish the last mission of the rank Captain, you will continue with the first mission of this rank again. Control wise in the Amiga version you play the game with the joystick, with the stick you control the plane and with the fire button you fire your weapons. Pushing the button fires your rockets, bombs or torpedoes, but pushing and holding the button fires the machine guns. Even though the controls are relatively simple, it still takes a little bit of training to have your Hellcat fully under control. Especially when it comes to landing the Hellcat, many people have problems getting that done. Starting and landing on an aircraft carrier happens always in only one direction, from the back to the front of the ship. 
Now in the Amiga version you can also take off in the other direction, but you can only land in one direction. In order to land you have to fly from the right side to the carrier on a low altitude and then you have to push the joystick up to bring the plane to a slow descent. On the back of the plane there is a hook and with this hook you have to catch one of the four resting gears on the carrier in order to land and also stop the plane on the ship. Then you have to bring the plane on the elevator, push the fire button and then the plane will lower inside the ship. Inside the ship the plane gets refueled, repaired, ammunition and you can choose which type of ammunition you want and then take off again. Graphically the game looks good, we got some nice details here and there, like on the planes and ships, plus the explosions also don't look that bad at all. But overall I would say the graphics are average for an Amiga game. In terms of sound, the music at the beginning of the game and also at the end of the game when you see the high score, they are basically alright. During the game you only hear the sound effects and in my opinion they are actually pretty good. Especially the explosions and the machine guns have a certain, let's say, heaviness to them. Which gives you the impression that those weapons have an immense penetration power. For short gaming sessions Wings of Fury is really a great game. But it doesn't have much in terms of long time motivation and it gets repetitive pretty fast. Most of that has to do with the fact that you never have a lot of ammunition so you often have to fly back to your carrier to get more ammunition. And in later levels you have to do this even more often. Not only because you just run out of ammunition but also because your plane needs to be constantly repaired or refueled since you have to fly longer and longer distances to get to another enemy target. Also free lives is not much in this game and earning an extra life with every promotion is a little bit unfair in my opinion. Now one thing that I've learned by making this review, which I didn't knew back in the days, is that in the Amiga and in the PC version you can actually save your game. You just have to be inside your carrier and press the control and the G key on your keyboard. This brings up the save menu and there you can save your progress. And if you want to load your game you just need to select return to R&R at the rank selection screen. And this also brings up the save menu where you can load your game. So this was one thing that I always criticized about this game, that it doesn't have a save feature when in fact there actually is one. Which makes the game easier and of course more enjoyable since you can save your progress and continue later on with it. But back in the days there was another solution. Cheating! If you type in the cheat code Colin was here, you can get unlimited ammunition, you can repair your plane during the flight, you can refuel it during the flight, you can also change the weapon type and you can get an extra life, all of that just by the push of a button. Colin was here was a well known cheat code back in the days and I guess one of the reasons why so many people knew about it, beside from video game magazines, is that some versions actually came packaged with it, like in my case. This is a re-release and belongs to the Respray collection or edition, which is basically like Greatest Hits or Platinum re-release. Inside the box is a little envelope and inside the envelope is the code and a little description about what it does and how to use it. Even though it's not mentioned on the sheet you can also refuel the plane by pressing the F key, repairing the plane by pressing the D key and change the weapon type by pressing the C key on the keyboard. What I also like about this release are the screenshots on the back of the box, since all three screenshots show the game with activated cheat code. A little bit unusual, but whatever. Two of the screenshots show the game during a night mission, so now you know how those look as well. Like already mentioned in the beginning, Wings of Fury was released on many other systems as well. And beside the fact that depending on the system and its capabilities, the game looks and sounds differently on each system, 
Each version of the game is almost identical. For this review I also played the PC DOS and the Commodore 64 version, which I'm gonna show you right now. And I wanted to mention a few things about those versions. The first thing is that in both versions for some kind of reason it's a little bit harder to pull out of a dive maneuver. It seems like you only have total control over your plane on a low altitude while the game is in this close up view mode. Since when you start a dive maneuver on a higher altitude you are only able to really pull out of a dive on a low altitude, so right before the ground, which makes dive bombing super risky in those versions. Next thing that I wanted to mention is that in the Commodore 64 version they changed the tactics of the enemy planes, since at first, no matter what I did, I could never get behind one of them, they were always behind my back. Now normally to get behind an enemy plane you have to make up and down maneuvers, so pull up and dive maneuvers you have to do in order to get the enemy planes in front of you. And in the Commodore 64 versions they changed their tactics to circle maneuvers. So you have to circle around an enemy plane until it breaks off a circle maneuver and then you can get behind it. So this is actually the change that they made for the Commodore 64 version. And one other thing that I have noticed is that in the Commodore 64 version the anti-aircraft guns from ships and concrete bunkers have a longer range and they can even hit you at the highest altitudes. So this is also another difference in the Commodore 64 version. Now I haven't played all the other versions but from what I know the only major differences between some versions are that only in the Amiga, PC-98, Sharp X-68000 and the Amstrad version you have day and night missions. In the rest you only have night missions. Then in the Amiga and PC-DOS version you have the ability to save your game and in the PC-98 and the Sharp X-68000 version the roles are actually reversed. So you fly for the Japanese Empire with a zero and you fight against the American forces. There is only one version which is a lot different than other versions and that is the Game Boy Color version. In this version you not only fly day and night missions, you fly on different times during the day and night. So early morning, noon, evening, late at night and so on. We now have a few more indicators on the bottom of the screen which are more or less useful, like altitude, horizon indicator, direction, slash compass and there is a little red light on the left side which alerts you if an enemy plane is nearby. Your Hellcat is now able to hold three torpedoes at once, the rest of the ammunition is the same like in the Amiga version. You now can destroy planes on the ground, which is actually pretty cool, and you need the same tactic like in the Commodore 64 version in order to shoot down enemy planes. Ships have now two kinds of anti-aircraft guns, one kind which can only be destroyed with rockets and the other one can also be destroyed with bombs. Even though the manual says otherwise, your machine guns will have no effect on ground targets. The soldiers on the island were replaced by a jeep which drives up and down the island. If the jeep passes a destroyed anti-aircraft gun, it will repair it, so the jeep should always be the first target on an island. And there's also a construction truck as a new target in this version. It doesn't do anything like the barracks, but you also need to destroy those as well in order to finish a mission. As far as I know, there are no torpedo planes in this version, so at least your carrier is always safe. The elevator on the carrier is gone, so you only have to land, and then the Hellcat gets immediately repaired, refueled, ammunition, and you can change the weapon type if you want to, and take off again. The Game Boy Color version has 15 missions and instead of a save function, the game has a password function and you get a password every time you finish the mission. 
Graphically and sound-wise the Game Boy Color version is alright and the controls are very responsive. So overall the Game Boy Color version is a very good version of Wings of Fury. So now that we have seen a couple of versions of Wings of Fury, let's come to my final verdict. And again, I haven't played all the versions that are available of the game, but I've played now four different versions and also I've watched a couple of videos on YouTube about all the other available versions and I also read a couple of articles about those versions as well. And I have to say that it looks like that Wings of Fury is on every system that the game was released on either a good or sometimes even a great game. For me personally my favorite version is still the Commodore Amiga version. For me it has the best graphics, the best sound and also the best controls slash the controls are spot on and you always have your F6F Hellkit, <coughs> Hellcat sorry, fully under control which makes it very enjoyable to play. And yeah, one, one other thing, it's also the Amiga version is also the, the version that I've played the most. So in the end, this might have affected my uh, final verdict a little bit. Then there are actually also a couple more versions available of Wings of Fury, which are newer versions. There is at least uh, one Android version that I know about. Then there's a PC ring. <coughs> Sorry. Then there's one PC remake with better graphics and better sound and there's also a second PC remake slash sequel which is called Wings of Fury 2 which is a 3D game or at least the graphics are in 3D but the game is still a 2D game and even though I appreciated that uh, people making remakes of classics in the case of Wings of Fury well I'm actually totally okay with the original game, so I was never really interested in trying out or playing those newer versions. But in the end, I still think it's cool that people make those games. Okay, um, yeah, I would recommend Wings of Fury, of course, to every video gamer who likes action games slash shooters, and of course, I would also recommend the game to every video game collector. And now that we come to the video game collectors, let's talk about prices. The Game Boy Color version is the cheapest version that you can get and it's also the most common version that you can get. For a complete copy of Wings of Fury on the Nintendo Game Boy Color, you can expect to pay prices between 15 to 30 euros on sites like eBay for instance. All the other versions today have become pretty rare and people are asking actually a lot for those games. Um, yeah, for for a complete Amiga version first release, you can expect that people are asking between 150 euros to 350, uh, yeah, to 300 euros, sorry. And this, again, this is for first release. The re-release version that I have, normally people are asking for this version between 50 to 90 euros. And for most of the other versions that are available of the game, you can also expect prices between 150 to 300 euros. Only the PC98 and the Sharp X68000 versions, they, yeah, they will cost you a lot more, or at least people are asking a lot more for those versions, because I've seen, uh, yeah, some examples where people are asking around a thousand euros and sometimes even more. So I actually can't say if the games are actually that, uh, that the games are actually worth that much, but for me personally, it's a little bit high. Now it took me over six years to finally find uh, an Amiga version for a reasonable price. And last year it finally happened that I found this version. To be honest, uh, I would have preferred a first release but I'm actually super happy with this one because I was very lucky and I got this for only 33 euros with shipping and yeah so in the end yeah I'm, I'm super happy and super lucky that I found this version 
Wings of Fury on the Commodore Amiga is a real and true classic. It's a great action game slash shooter. It is one of those games that almost everybody who owned an Amiga back in the days has played at least once. And it's also one of those few games that come to mind when people think about the Commodore Amiga. I'm the Retro Gambler and this was my review of Wings of Fury for the Commodore Amiga, the Nintendo Game Boy Color, and yeah, a little bit about the PC DOS version and the Commodore 64 version. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Maybe see you next time. Take care. Bye.